Welcome to the Affiliate Interview Series by Statstrone. Today's guest is Phil Fraser, who is a business coach and also a former affiliate. Let's get to it. Okay, welcome to the Affiliate Interview Series. I've got a guest with me today, uh, Phil Fraser, who on his LinkedIn profile has a uh, former Mr. Online Bingo. Uh, Phil is a business coach, and I'm going to hand it over to Phil to um, tell us more about what you do now. Okay. Hi, John. Thanks for having me on. Um, I am now what I call a business sounding board. So I work with uh, business owners uh, to help them be better business owners. You know, Those people who run their own businesses will know and identify that it's lonely at the top. And what I do is I sit with business owners and allow them to discuss whatever topics they want to discuss. It might be problems, it might be opportunities, it might be frustrations, it might be lack of clarity, whatever it might be. The sort of stuff that as a business owner, you don't have anybody else to talk to about. Um, you know, particularly if you've got a team, you know, and I had this when I was running my business, you don't want to say to the team, hey guys, I'm making this up as I go along. I don't know what I'm doing, which was the, which was the case for a lot of the time. <laughs> now that's interesting. So I, I guess like, you know, my next question is kind of like, what led you towards becoming a business coach? Like you just mentioned the idea that, I mean, you kind of don't really want to tell your team that you're figuring this out as you go, but we know in the world of business, especially in our backgrounds in affiliate marketing, sometimes that's just the way you don't really have a chance to calibrate and kind of look around and go, who can I compare myself to? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the way it happened, um, I sold my business. It's just coming up to five years ago. So we sold to Excel media um, and I, we sold, we, I got out of the business and it was, you know, okay, what do I do next? Um, and I sat down with a friend of mine who is a business coach, is a business strategist, and he said, hey, you want to be a, you, you should be a business mentor. And my first response to that was, who am I to be a business mentor? I, you know, I just made it up as I went along and sort of passed it aside and, 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 and left it. And, and what happened was subsequent to that, I had various friends and, and contacts who run businesses who started coming to me and say, hey, Phil, you know, can I just have 10 minutes of your time? Can we talk about this? Can we talk about that? I've got this issue. I've got this problem. I've got this opportunity. Um, and they seem to get a benefit out of it. So pretty much it was must have been, it was around locked, lockdown time. I sat in the garden thinking, well, you know, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, you know, people seem to be getting a benefit from what I'm doing. And I love talking to people about their businesses. I'm, you know, I'm interested in business. And people seem to be getting a benefit from this. So, hey, why don't you, you know, Go for it and, and, and offer it as a, a sort of a commercial offering. And it falls somewhere between coach and mentor. And there's a bit of coaching and there's a bit of mentoring, but pretty much it's me listening to business owners and then bouncing ideas around with them. So as a coach, are you also kind of figuring this out as you go? Or do you kind of uh, take a bit of a, um, you know, talk to other coaches or kind of like read up on, you know, different ways of coaching, especially in the world of business? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've. It, it's interesting, sort of now looking back at my business journey. I think there were there were four different points of our journey when I had somebody external coming in at, at different different levels and at different points in the journey, and, and most of them were strategic to a specific issue. Um, but I've seen the benefit of what I can do with people in their issue. So I've. The reason I didn't call myself a business coach, I always think a business coach is is teaching you, or, or any type of coach, is teaching you to do a particular skill better. So in business, it might be presentation skills, it might be sales, it, you know, it could be anything. And it's just saying, right, you're here at this ability level, I'm going to move you to here. Um, and so I'm nearer a mentor than a coach, but there is some coaching that goes into it. So often what I'm now finding is... We discuss. I'm discussing topics with clients, and the same sort of things come up. And I've written a lot of stuff on my website, and I can say, "Look, I'm referring to this and referring to that." Now, that that may be coaching, or it's giving them examples, or it can be giving them uh, structures to work around. So maybe it is coaching, but it's not. I can't say I'm going to make you do this skill better. 
other than hopefully make you, you know, the whole picture, make you a business owner and make you a better business owner. Um, what, what are some of the common pitfalls that you're finding, whether you've, you know, coached people in seeing kind of common problems that uh, business owners get stuck with or things that you maybe hear and read about? Yeah, I think the, 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 the most common one, and, and, and it's interesting, the reason I think I can coach, coach and help people is, is the, the whole been there and done that, you know, got the T-shirt. And it's, it's funny because lots of the issues that come up, I've done. So I'm speaking from experience. And one of the main ones I find is, is business owners who've sort of set up a business and it's grown, they've added, you know, some staff or whatever it might be. And they are not doing the job of a business, of a, of a CEO or a managing director. They're still doing some of the minutia, some of the really small jobs. And now I, I, I read this somewhere and I use it a lot now. Is Are you doing the £10 an hour jobs, the £100 an hour jobs, or the £1,000 an hour jobs? And it's down to this sort of theory of opportunity cost. And what happens is, as your business grows, you either keep hold of stuff you like doing, or you get left with stuff you haven't got somebody else in to do yet. And you carry on doing them. And me coming in from the outside, I'll be talking to business owners and they'll say, well, I'm, you know, I do this job and I do this. Job. And I go, well, hang on a minute. Why, you know, you're the CEO of this business. Why are you still doing? And I did it. In, in my case, I was still sending invoices out when we were a million pound plus turnover business. Now, how many CEOs send out invoices so i got a bookkeeper in who could do it better than me do it quicker than me i paid her you know i'll use the numbers but it, it wasn't you know, i paid her 10 pound an hour so i can now do the 100 pound an hour or thousand pound an hour jobs and that issue is the one that lots and lots of business owners get stuck with would you say that's maybe one of the things that separates you know people that don't really <laughs> get to the next level like is that probably one of the main core yeah. elements Absolutely, absolutely. And in our in, in our business journey, you know, surprise, surprise, every time we took on a member of staff, our turnover and our profit went up because you're expanding your capacity in, in whatever level that might be. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I can't afford, insert job title for what the, I can't afford an SEO manager, I can't afford a VA, I can't afford a bookkeeper, I can't afford an account manager, whatever, a co content writer, whatever it might be. And something that was taught to me Again, right at the start, and this is when we were taking on our first member of staff. And, and again, that's one of the, the big step ups. It's a scary step up of taking on a member of staff. Somebody said to me, look, if you take on somebody, let's say they, they, they earn £24,000 a year. Okay. So as a business owner, you think, and it, particularly if it's early in the business journey and, and you're still you know, still growing, £24,000, I can't afford that. Actually, your exposure is only two thousand pounds, because in most instances, it's a month. You know, particularly the first three months when you're on probation, it's a month's notice. So actually, your exposure, your risk, is two thousand pounds, not twenty four thousand pounds. And what will usually happen is in that first one, two, three months, you'll realise, geez, this is a really good idea, because for that two thousand pounds a month I'm spending, I can now, as the business owner, make four thousand pounds a month because I'm doing. The important stuff that I've handed over to this person, because the this person I've, I've got in is doing some of the lesser stuff. And, and that's important, is, is just understanding what your role is as a CEO. And, and it, you can be a CEO with two people, but it's it's what your role is, you know. Yeah, it, it's almost, um, there's like some irony there where you can look at these things and from your point of view, you're like, this is obvious what you should do. But I think uh, the things that, um, you know, a lot of business owners get stuck in is they, they're they so immersed in their work that they can't take a step back or they can't, they don't take time off to kind of reflect on the things that they need to look at. And sometimes you need a, an outside pair of eyes to actually point out the obvious and, um, and you know, maybe that can be the thing that, you know, helps you pivot and, you know, make a drastic change which is the obvious yeah yeah and it, it, it is and a lot of what i do seems obvious because it's easy looking at somebody else you know, people could people could look at me at what i'm doing and go phil you should be doing this you should be doing that and i'll, I'll be making obvious stuff but looking outside in you can say to people really you, you you know this is glaringly obvious this is glaringly obvious this is glaringly obvious and then or, or even it's actually not even saying this is glaringly obvious. It's you know it's it's 
often the case of just by discussing things with people, the penny drops and then they go, ah, right, okay, now I can see. I, you know, I will allow them to work out what their issue is without me telling them. So you obviously have a background in affiliate marketing, and I think that's uh, your main um, you know, entry into the business world. Uh, have you had a lot of mentors or do you have any stories or situations you can share where someone's kind of given you that outside advice that's kind of given you a different look on your own business? Yeah, as I said, during, during our business journey, we had a number of people came in. Um, and the, the one that probably made the biggest difference was somebody who came in towards the end of our business journey. And by which time we were quite a large business, there were lots of stuff going on. And he did a really, he did a fascinating 360 with, with every member of the team, which I've now done subsequently with a couple of my clients, where he asked, he sat down with each individual member of the team and said, you know, what's good, what's bad, what, you know, but sort of like a SWOT analysis of the business to each person and then presented back the findings to me. So it wasn't, you know, he said, she said, it was like, this is the general trend, you know, most of your team are saying this or most of your team are saying that. And one of the key things that came back was, was I was the problem. I was one of the problems. I was stopping the business growing by, and, and again, many executives and many business owners will, will, will recognize this, is uh, as an entrepreneur, you see ideas everywhere. Here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. So I'd come in on a Monday morning and go, hey, guy, I've got this great idea. I saw something over the weekend. We're going to do this. Or I've bought in the affiliate market, and every affiliate will recognize this one. I've bought this brilliant domain. I've got a great idea what to do with it. And then the team would I'd go, right, this is my brilliant idea this week. And then I'd go back to them and say, well, why hasn't this been done on, you know, on the main site, on which bingo, for example? And they go, well, we're doing your exciting new project. And it's like, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. I'm bored with that one. And, and this guy that came in basically said, look, you have got to get out of the way of this business. You take all your ideas. And he actually said to me, set up a separate company to put all these stupid ideas in and let the guys get on with running the main business. And, and that was one of the key lessons I learned. And, and, and again, I sort of see that I've got a client at the moment I'm dealing with and you know, we've, he's got, a, as many, many affiliates have, have a portfolio of sites and the good old 80-20 rule comes in play and he, 20% of his work is on his main site, which brings him 80% of his revenue. So looking on the outside in, you go, well, just do that. Well, no, 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 you know, I want to do these other, these other sites because they may, they may get bigger and I'm spreading my risk. And, you know, there, there are logical reasons for doing it, but looking outside in is like, well, if you didn't do any of the other businesses or the other, any of the other websites, just spend all your time on, on the main one. But because we're all entrepreneurs and we see these ideas around, where everybody does the same thing. So, you know, we had a humongous list of, of, of domains that we, I had a brilliant idea for each one, never did. <laughs> it, it, it almost sounds like, you know, you're, you're looking at my business and talking about me <laughs> where... You know, I think if we had this conversation a year ago, I probably would have got red in the face and go, hmm, I think he is talking about me. And I've been kind of fortunate enough to listen to enough people to get that feedback and really look in the mirror and go, OK, you know, I'm an ideas person. I'm an entrepreneur by heart. And I, you know, I like the next best shiny thing, but I've found a way to somehow to reel that in and kind of hold back. And um, it's uh, and it's interesting watching other people do it. And it's not easy to kind of change and realize yeah. that you're the one who's getting in the way yeah 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 and and you know we we were very fortunate that we we focused on on bingo that's all that's all we did despite me uh, very early in our journey uh dipping a toe in the water in online poker and then sort of pulling out of that quite quickly because i couldn't work it out and then later in the journey trying to get involved in sports betting and again just thinking sort of three months in, nope, this isn't working, get out of that. Um, and towards the, end of, towards the end of our business journey, we then focused on slots specifically. But that was, a, that was an adjunct to bingo, so it was, that was more logical than the other ones. 
Well, I'm going to take a, a note that I wrote down, which I think is interesting. It's you said a SWOT analysis of your own business. I mean, normally when you hear the word SWOT, you're like, okay, let's look at my market, my competitors, but you're not really looking inward. And uh, it's the first time I've heard that. And that's uh, very on point. And it's, it's also, it's more beneficial doing it with the team because they see things, you know, everybody sees things from a different perspective. Uh, but particularly if you do it with your team, you know, that you, your content writer will complain about, you know, how we upload content. Your SEO guy will complain that the designer is not designing it to SEO standards. The designer will say the content looks horrible in my beautiful design. You know, you as the leader, you're, you're never here. So you're, we haven't got a clear strategy. So everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else. But as a, as a leader, you need to be able to take all that on board and go, right, I mean, I had to take on board, Phil, you're getting in the way of the business. Get out of the way of the business. That's, <laughs> that's quite a tough one to take. Um, but as a business owner, you need to take this and go, right, okay, I can see the issues. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's something really, really simple, like your SEO guy saying, look, I've got too much work to do. I need an, I need an SEO executive. And you go, well, okay, let's, let's do it. But unless you've given them the opportunity to express that, sometimes that doesn't come out. Um, going back to like, you know, trying to be efficient and hiring the right people. Um, obviously it's quite obvious that you could hire the wrong people and spend money and set yourself back. So what are your, what are your takes or tips for, you know, hiring the right people? And, um, you know, I think there's a phrase that everyone keeps saying, which is, you know, hire slow, fire fast. And I'm sure you're going to say something along those lines, but, um, like what, what's your advice on how to, how to hire the right way and what are, what are best practices? I think there's a, there's a number of things we learned along the way, um, uh, and they both come from different from different angles. The first was be being very very clear what the role is that you're hiring for and the skill set that is required. So you, you know we need and you know, SEO is an easy one. We need an SEO manager who understands online gambling, right? So and then you can from that you well he needs or she needs five years experience, whatever it might be. So you can look at it objectively like that. The other side of it comes completely differently, which is um, get good people on the bus first and then find a seat for them. So if you come across good people, you think, look, you know, just in an interview, this, is, this kid's really great, got lots of enthusiasm, I could really work with him, he's got some great ideas. Let's get him in the building, get him a, you know, get him a desk and a, and a laptop and a a screen and and let's just see where it goes and and that, that sort of fluidity is really good as well because you're getting good quality people on board um i think the other thing one of the things again we did towards the end of our time was we did or, or i did and then delegated it down to my number two was we did weekly uh one-to-ones with all our team hmm. now that is a great way of getting instant feedback all the time and you get an understanding of the type of people you're dealing with very, very quickly. Some people will sit in a one-to-one -one and they'll tell you everything and everything. They'll tell you about the family, the kids, the dog, whatever it might be. Other people won't say anything. But having that, that uh, conduit to get that feedback in gives you an understanding of people, their strengths. One of the things we said to our team all the time is, what training do you want? Because they're the ones, who, rather than me saying, I'm gonna put you on this course, you know, what training do you want? Okay, I want training on whatever it might be. We tell them, okay, go away, find a, find a solution. It might be a digital one, it might be a group one, whatever it might be. And I was always happy, not happy, but I always took it on the chin when a member of my team came to me and said, look, I've, I've got another job, I'm leaving. Because it said to me, I've trained somebody up to a degree that somebody else wants them. And, you know, you... Even the most important role in your business, somebody's replaceable. Nobody's irreplaceable. And that's the key thing. One of the key things to remember is, look, and then you get into discussions about um, the concept of brilliant jerks. So people who are good at their job, but are so toxic with everybody else that you have to bite the bullet and, and, and go, right, you've got to go. Despite them being... You know, the best salesperson, the best SEO guy you've ever had, the best designer you've ever had. If he's pissing everybody else off, 
or she's pissing everybody else off. The team are going to look at you as the manager and go, or the, the leader and go, well, hang on, why is he allowing that to happen? And eventually they'll just go, bollocks, I'm leaving, I'll go somewhere else. But you have to bite the bullet and go, despite you being the best salesperson we've got, I'm getting rid of you. Because as a cumulative thing with the whole team, you're bringing everybody down. And it's, it, it's something, again, I've seen in a couple of clients where it's quite obvious they have this situation and they find it really, really difficult. And it is difficult. It's very, very difficult. But I, I guarantee the first thing you'll say the day after you get rid of them is, shit, I wish I'd done this earlier. Yeah. I'll say less comments on, on that. I've had a couple of my own experiences and it's the same thing. It's uh, at least I get shorter uh, with the time every time that happens. Yeah. Um, so you've obviously gone from starting off as like, you know, probably a one person show and then growing a business. And now you're back. I'm assuming you're just running this new consulting as the one person again. Um, yep. What's right. different? I'm assuming that it's kind of like a, a mix of a breath of fresh air, but I'm sure you kind of look at the old business and, Miss some aspects of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And it's, it's, um, we were fortunate to, to sell the business, what I felt was at its peak. So I've got no regrets about selling, but I, you know, the thing I miss most is the team. And we had a great team and, you know, I'm still in touch with a lot of them. Um, what I'm doing now gives me a lot of flexibility. So I've got nobody, nobody looking at me going, even if, even when it's my business and I, you know, I might go to the gym and then turn up at 11 o'clock in the office. And even if it's my, it's my business, I'm the boss. You can still see them going, it's 11 o'clock. Where, where have you been? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so running your own business and being on your own, I can go wherever I want, do whatever I want. I've got nobody looking at me going, what are you doing? The problem is, and the main problem I found is having been in online gaming for 18 years, and being sort of fairly well known, being able to sort of turn up to any conference or exhibition and, and people knew who I was and what we did and all that sort of stuff. I've got to comp I'm now in the process of reinventing myself. You know, I go into a you know, networking meeting or something like that and it's, you know, who are you? Whereas, you know, turn up at EGR or IGB and you'll be like, hi, 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 you know. And that's difficult. That really is difficult, reinventing yourself. You know, all that credit in the bank in online gaming means absolutely nothing. I'm sure it still is there. I know if you show up to these conferences, people will be like, oh, where you've been and you know what are you up to? It's uh, There's yeah. always going to be an evolution of uh, everyone in the entire industry. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, whilst I've, whilst I've stepped out of the industry, I've got a couple of clients who have come from the industry. So I'm still, you know, I keep, I keep one eye on what's going on. Yeah, so... What is what was your story in getting started in the bingo space? Like, how did that happen? I'm sure a lot of people, you know, re rewinding time back, like up to 20 years ago, um, people are like online gambling, online bingo. Like people understood casino and sports betting, but yeah. bingo, I think, was like a whole level of crazy back then. So how did yeah. this all start? Uh, so my story goes all the way back to 2000. So I was hired by William Hill to launch what was their, then their first ever online casino. Um, and while I was at William Hill, we came across online bingo as a product. Um, and it was only in the US at the time. So I was, I was tasked with doing a presentation to the board, you know, strengths, weaknesses, should we do it? Should we not get into it? Whatever it might be, which I did. And then William Hill decided at that time, not, not to get into it. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. They were making loads of money on sports book, sports book at the time. Cause they were quite early into the market. That was fine. Um, I left at the end of that year and started just working as a consultant in online gaming because I had a year's experience. And back in 2001, that was like, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, and somebody came to me and said, you know, I, I want to get into online gaming. It's obviously a growing market. What do you recommend? So I said to them, you want to get into online bingo, next big thing. And almost 24, 48 hours later, I was thinking, well, hang on a minute. I'm advising him to get into online bingo. Why don't I do it? So I sort of dusted down this presentation that I'd done to William Hill, rehashed it, and turned it into an investment pitch and took it out to market to get funding for what would have been the UK's first ever pay-to-play online bingo site. So I was ahead of the market. Got nothing at all, absolutely zero. A couple of nibbles, no money whatsoever. 
But what happened was I built a very basic website which listed um, all the US bingo sites that were around at the time. And on it, I put a very simple pop-up questionnaire to get some data for my presentation. So sort of age, sex, demographics, spend patterns, that sort of thing. So, so when I was presenting, it sounded like I knew what I was talking about. Um, and what happened was um, a number of the bingo sites that were on my website contacted me and said, can we advertise on your website? And I said, yes, um, you know, and, and it, it, it just so happens my background pre-William Hill, a lot of it was spent selling advertising in newspapers and magazines. Um, so I said, yeah, send me some money and we'll put some banners on the website and we'll go from there. And that was which bingo. That's how it started. Totally, utterly by accident. Um, it was just myself and my wife. And we were fortunate that we got in very early. And obviously, as the bingo market grew, we grew. And the other thing I think we were very lucky about was the, the sort of thought process of, of the bookies was, was sports betting. Then we'll get into casino. Then we'll get into poker. And obviously, they're all sort of male-dominated products, whereas bingo was a bit of a, a tangent, was sort of over there, and people have spend money on bingo. And we were left alone. So we had a lot of the field on our own for many, many years. Um, and the business grew like that. That's how it started. Wow, that's... Uh... Real interesting story, but it's kind of cool that you really had market share for a long time. And, you know, I, I kind of look at bingo uh, today as being, you know, one of those neglected niches that people go, it's not exciting. They don't see the money in it, but we kind of know the money's there. And if anything, I think uh, one more niche that I also believe is just as neglected is lottery. You know, I think everyone's chasing what's shiny, what you see on TV. And yep. it really comes down to sports, casino, poker. But, um, you know, um, I guess that's the the um, the saying, you know, the the riches are in the niches. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, we, as I said, we 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 sort of dabbled our toe in poker when it sort of really took off, sort of two thousand two thousand three, and got out very very quickly because I I don't understand poker, I don't play poker, I couldn't get my head around it, and just carried on with bingo. So we up to two thousand five when UIGA hit. We were all U.S. The whole, I think we had 85% of our revenue was in the U.S. So that disappeared overnight when UIGA happened. But we'd already seen that it was coming to the U.K. So we had a, a U.S. version of the site and a, and a U.K. version of the site. So when everybody decamped from the U.S. to the U.K., we were sort of there with a the website going, hello, we're here. And obviously we had five years experience already of running um, what became a major affiliate. That's awesome. Uh, Phil, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? Okay, so you can usually find me on LinkedIn um, there most days I'll, or visit my website, which is philfraser.co.uk. Do not go to philfraser.com because that's a medieval costume reenactment company. So if you see pictures of Robin Hood and that type of thing, that's not me. You're on the wrong side. So philfraser.co.uk. Awesome. Thank you.